Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Brian Robinette, and I am a professor of theology here at Boston College. And on behalf of Boston College and uh, all who have helped to make this event possible, I welcome you here uh, in presence and to all of those who are joining us by live stream, which is quite a number. That's my understanding that there would be a number of people joining us by Zoom. I'll just make a quick note for those on Zoom. I'm told to let those who are being admitted into Zoom to please mute your mic and please mute your camera. Uh, that way it, it takes on the form of a webinar style as close as, as it possibly can. As I mentioned, my name is Brian Robinette. I teach theology in the, in the department and have uh, for 10 years. And I don't think I'm mistaken in saying that this is a unique experience for, for BC. Um, the opportunity that we have um, here this evening and an event like this is unique. And I think that it bodes, uh, well, it's auspicious for more events like these to come. I would like to thank a few uh, entities and people specifically for helping to make this event. First of all, I would like to thank the School of Theology and Ministry, uh, whose grounds we are on, for opening up this uh, beautiful space, which has been nicely renovated uh, recently, and, um, and for facilitating all of this, and Steve Dalton and Megan De Dios in particular for all of their work. Thank you for that. I would also like to thank uh, the Institute of Liberal Arts, which is a co-sponsor of this event and a sponsors events like these with regularity. And then I would also like to thank the theology department uh, for its co-sponsorship for this event um, and for being such um, a welcoming uh, presence um, for, for this event. I want to just very briefly acknowledge uh, those also in, it, in attendance. Uh, with Rinpoche, Lama um, Gyatso is here. We can welcome him, and Lama Tashi are here, and these are very close companions. And, um, and I also want to mention um, the, the team, uh, Justin Kelly and Dylan Hensley are here, and thank you. And we had a, a wonderful um, time walking around campus all together and having uh, dinner together, and so thank you for all of your efforts in this. I would now like to hand it over to my uh, good friend and, and colleague, Professor Lama John McCransky, who uh, just recently retired from the theology department. He taught here for 30 some odd years. And, um, and um, I, it is my great honor to have been his colleague for the 10 years that I have been here. And he will introduce our special guest in the way that Lama John can. So again, thank you for being here, and I look forward to the conversation. So welcome, and happy Saka Dawa, <laughs> which is a Tibetan term for one of the most uh, sacred holidays of the year in the Tibetan Buddhist world, which commemorates the birth and the enlightenment and the parinirvana of the Buddha. So this is considered like the most auspicious day and a day when if someone does something virtuous, uh, that the, 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 the positive karma from that is multiplied 100 million times because this is such a powerful day. And it's on this day that, uh, that Yonge Mingyur Rinpoche kindly uh, uh, was willing to come to Boston College. What a time for him to show up here. And so I just want to thank Rinpoche so much on behalf of Boston College for, for, his, for your presence. And um, Rinpoche's, just a very brief introduction to Rinpoche, uh, which can never do him justice, but Rinpoche's teachers and mentors are among the most eminent Tibetan figures of the 20th century, no exaggeration. And under their tutelage then, he completed all of his monastic and philosophical studies of Buddhism and was given the most in-depth training in uh, 
the meditative and ritual practices of Tibetan Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism. So Rinpoche has been entrusted with positions, even from a very young age, of retreat master, guiding teacher, and abbot in several important Tibetan monasteries. In 2002, 20 years ago, recognized for his meditative accomplishments, I mean, not bragging, it was just well known, and became well known among neuroscientists. So they, they really wanted to get a hold of him. And, uh, <laughs> and some of the leading neuroscientists uh, in, in the world actually requested Rinpoche to take part in what became pioneering research on the effects of meditation on the brain. Over the past 20 years, Rinpoche has emerged as one of the leading Tibetan meditation masters of his generation. Again, no, no exaggeration. It's just, I, what can I say except what's generally accepted? Uh, and also one of the most effective teachers of Buddhist concepts and meditation practices to modern audiences. So again, I'm such very grateful uh, that you could come. And so first, uh, just would ask you, Rinpoche, if you'd like to lead a very short meditation, and then uh, <clears throat> Brian and I would, would grill you with a few questions. <laughs> so. Yes. Um. I got there. Uh, maybe we can uh, do some intention, develop what we call generate motivation. So normally, all this the meditation practice, we begin by setting up like purposeful, meaningful um, motivation. So thinking that today we're going to learn something interdisciplinary dialogue and maybe something that benefit for ourselves and then can bring this peace to our family members, friends, maybe social circle and maybe to the bigger society. Sometimes what we call transforming yourself has a contagious. We have coronavirus contagious, right? <laughs> so now we have contagious of awareness, love and compassion, wisdom. Who knows? <laughs> so please, to put the sense, sense of purpose and acknowledge the, what we're going to uh, engage in. So please keep your spine loosely straight and you can, if you can, you can touch your both feet to the ground. Sometimes for me it's difficult, my legs short. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, please close your eyes if you like. And first, please relax muscles in the body and just feel the sense of the body, the touching sensation of your body with your cloth, chair, and maybe temperature. And just feel the gravity in the body. And if you can relax, wonderful. Cannot relax, also wonderful. Give permission that whether relax or not relax is okay. And you don't need to pretend to be anybody. You don't, you don't have to act to be somebody, be yourself and be free. And now appreciate that having this body is amazing. And still breathing, 
It's wonderful, isn't it? I'm alive. How wonderful. And can hear, can smell, can sense. How wonderful. And special today through this dialogue, maybe I can learn something. And that wisdom and experience I want to share to my friends, family, to others. Now please open your eyes. And it is a wonderful to have this eyes and can see things. When we appreciate that we can see and hear, then the world becomes different. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rupa So, at the heart of your uh, practice traditions uh, from Tibet, uh, right at the heart of it is what's called the nature of mind, samni, also called Buddha nature. So my first question is to try to get right to the heart of the matter, the very heart of things in terms of practice. Uh, what is the nature of mind or Buddha nature? And why is it important in Buddhist understanding? Yeah. Why is it so important uh, to, uh, to realize it? Yeah, so Buddha nature, what we call that everybody has a basic innate goodness, the intrinsic nature. So we have many names for that, sometimes what we call kada. Kada meaning the original purity, tathada garbha, the nature of gone beyond, and sukada garbha, the nature of blissful or joyful. So, so what we call everybody has this uh, potential and wonderful basic innate goodness. And that has three qualities, the clarity or awareness and love and compassion and wisdom, three in one. So in Asia, we can use uh, coffee, three in one. <laughs> very, very easy. Milk, coffee, sugar together. <laughs> and I cannot find here. <laughs> <laughs> but the traditional example is what we call like lamp, flame. Flame has a light. The flame is the light and flame is heat. There's an intrin intrinsic quality of heat. At the same time, color. So three in one. So same thing that intrinsic nature is connected with this awareness, love and compassion and wisdom. And the whole purpose of practice is what we call to discover that. So in a way, what we call you are a Buddha right now, right here. But the problem is we are not recognized. And, and that's a, what we call ignorant. So ignorant has so many layers, intellectual or conceptual level ignorant, of course. And there's a feeling level of ignorant. And there's a um, perception level. So almost change the the color of the eyes, ear, nose, tongue, touch. So three layers of ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah, ignorance. Right. <laughs> and then based on ignorance, then there's aversion, craving, then um, is created what we call boxes. Yes, no, both, neither, four boxes. And then we trap into these boxes, which is uh, a subject and object. And yes and no have, cannot agree each other. <laughs> Opposite, and they're fighting each other. And then there's a biases, partialities, concepts, and 
time, matter, so on, so on, so on, so on. Then we are trapped. So that's the obscuration. The traditional example is the diamond covered by mud. So even though diamond is totally covered by mud, still diamond is diamond. When you clean the mud, put on the crown, diamond in the mud, diamond on the crown, is same diamond. So um, just ignore this if it's not meaningful, but <laughs> since the nature of mind or Buddha nature is such a good thing, and if we were to realize it, it would be such a great thing to have realized, to, to realize those qualities and be them. What is ignorance, these layers of ignorance, trying to do? It, it, they don't really know the nature, they don't know the nature of mind, they don't know their own nature. Right. And then what are they trying to do? That, so we can understand why they're doing what they're doing that prevents us from knowing the nature of mind. Yeah, very grumpy and lazy. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> ignorance also coming from the Buddha nature in a way. So what we call, if there's a lamp, and we cover by lamp with a glass with a full of color, then what happened, the room is full of different colors. But the color come from the lamp in the middle, but the, um, filtered by the glass. Then we can have another glass, with the full of uh, scary image. What do you think scary image? Sometimes I have to be careful, you know. A some, spider? <laughs> some people love spider also. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever. For you, spider or rattlesnake or uh, Scorpio, mm -hmm. maybe ghost. <laughs> so it's covered by that um, glass. Then what happened, the room is appear as full of scary image but that scary image is coming from the light without flame you cannot have that scary image but the ignorance is this this filter this other ignorance and and special seeing scary image as real like a snake poison snake but it's just image but we don't know that's just image we perceive that real snake there so that's the ignorant also. So in a way, everything comes from the true nature mm. as a manifestation, but the filter by that ignorance. So that's a job of ignorance. Mm. So of course, probably many people hearing this would say, but we do need to avoid poisonous snakes. So they have some, they have some degree of reality. Uh, so we, but we could still do that being aware that our perception of the snake. Yeah, because is, it's just image. It's not really poison snake. But the problem is we appear as poison snake, as poison snake. Image of poison snake, mm -hmm. as real poison snake. Mm -hmm. But if when we know that it's just image, that's the liberation. Mm -hmm. It's just a manifestation. So the between, different between seeing poison snake, the image of poison snake as a real snake, then a lot of fear, suffering, all this problem, right? And you know, oh, it's just, just image. Ah, it's coming from here. Whew. <laughs> but take some time. So what, uh, the, the, in, in another kind of practical way, mm -mm. this also has to do with our images of everybody, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Like looking around the room, to, to me, many of the people look like just strangers. A few seem to matter because they're my wife and children. <laughs> uh, a few others, I don't know, look kind of annoying. <laughs> so that would be our, that would be ig the yeah. ignorance. Yeah. So uh, we have constructing or creating yes. an image that we mistake for the full reality. We have very funny example for what we call if the, the monkey mind, the conceptual mind, so create the, all this perception. So if our life has another big problem, the monkey mind is very happy with that big problem. And we don't see, we don't care about small problem. So when the big problem is finished, and there's a holiday for a few months or a few weeks, the monkey, <coughs> monkey mind is having holiday. 
And then the monkey mind began to look problem and one day go into bathroom. <laughs> and yeah, the two choice. One is about face, one about belly, and which one? You want to? Belly, belly raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know on the in, on online. Face, raise your hand. <laughs> so more people like belly, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having some something, you know, growing also. So go to the bathroom, look at the mirror. Oh, I have big belly. And we look at the right side, <laughs> left side. Oh, and then we have breakfast. And while having breakfast, thinking about the big belly, I think my belly is a little bit too big. <laughs> ah, it's a problem. And then what we call the, in the body, prana bindu nadi. The nerves, the, the nadi meaning nerves, prana means energy, not the, the bindu meaning cells, and they begin to form. Mind and body is what we call at the beginning support and supporter. And then go to the office. If we are busy, we forget about a big belly. Or oh, from nine to five. And finish work five and come back to home, relax. Oh yeah, big belly. <laughs> <laughs> and go to the bathroom again. Uh, then this, um, I discussed it with the neuroscience what they call neurons and they talk each other. Sometimes what I call gossipy neurons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like prana bindu nadi, mm -hmm. you know? And they make group, like, like new political group, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so then after a certain level, if you go to the uh, workplace, even if you're busy, you still remember your, bra your, your belly. Oh, now my boss is looking at my belly. <laughs> my friend is looking at my belly. He is looking at my belly. She is looking at my belly. Now everybody is looking at my belly. Maybe they are not looking at, you know. And then after a certain level, if you go outside, we feel like everybody is looking. And when you look at you, you, you look very ugly. So next month, you look at the same mirror. Looks like you are become much uglier than last. Last month, actually, probably same. But then we create that concept, then, then almost like become in the end 3D. So that's the, how we create the concept. It's just a small example with the belly, but it will appear with the many things. So we kind of get imprisoned yeah. in these layers of ignorance, imprisoned in a way that we, we don't have much access to nature of mind's qualities. Yeah. So then how do practices or what, kinds of practices or how does practice or what sort of practice helps cut through the layers of ignorance and um, help us to realize the qualities of the nature of mind and become that more. Yeah, so first of what we call awareness practice. So being with the reality as it is. So at the beginning we can focus on the breath or sound or any phenomena. Nothing cannot become support for meditation. There's a two types of meditation, what we call one is object oriented, one is subject oriented. So object oriented meaning only breath. Breath is important. Let go of past. Let go of future. Present now with the breath. Oh, pizza, pizza, not pizza. Breath. <laughs> to do list, no, no, no. Breath. So that's the object oriented. And for, for my, our, the natural mind style of what we call subject oriented. Subject meaning the awareness. Awareness meaning the quality of the mind, clear and knowing or sublime, sublime, sublime aspect, the like lamp, lamp illuminated by itself. But of course, at the beginning, we cannot connect with that, but the lamp has true clarity. One is self clarity, meaning the lamp illuminates itself. But at the same time, the lamp illuminate things around, so whatever things around can, can see, can illuminate. So this, the luminous quality of mind can manifest through the eye, so you can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can test all this, but of course, Rana Bindu Nadi, the body also connect with that. So we get in touch with our own mind, maybe to be aware of breath, for example, what we call breathing meditation, Anybody who practiced breathing meditation before? Raise your hand. Okay, many of you. 
And some of you, not yet, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so I, maybe I will teach you breathing meditation. How many of you are breathing right now? Raise your hand. <laughs> Finish. <laughs> so that is a breathing meditation. To be aware of breath. So that is awareness. And slowly, slowly we can aware of form, sound, smell, touch, sensation, thought, any emotion, everything. Then in the end, be with the awareness itself. So this through awareness we can connect with the our true nature, and another one through loving kindness, compassion. So what we call all these clashes, the confusion, ignorance, or craving, hatred. I had panic when I was young, panic attacks. So panic, depression. The essence, deeper level, is love and compassion. And how many of you want to be happy? Raise your hand. <laughs> mm. So there is based for love, love or loving kindness. And we don't want to have problem, right? Don't want to suffer. That's a base or basis of compassion. So loving kindness, wish to be happy, good, meaningful, something nice. Compassion, wanting to free from problem, obstacle. So that's the intrinsic feeling. That's why you come here. And right now here, you're moving, you know, some, something like this, something like this. So, <laughs> each movement is looking for happiness. Each eyes gleam, gleam. Each breath is looking for happiness. So, and not only the body, each thought, each emotion, each feeling. When you go deeper level, is looking for happiness, being, wanting to be happiness. Wanting to free from suffering maybe to yourself, your friends, your family, to the world. So through that, we can connect with the love in it, through the true nature. Another through wisdom. And the wisdom has a lot of things to say. Maybe, maybe we, can, we can save later. Um, I don't mean for this to be a long answer, but just like in brief, how does the cultivation of awareness and cultivation of love and compassion cut through the layers of ignorance? Uh, I understand how they bring out qualities of our innate nature, our Buddha nature, they're kind of bringing them out. Uh, so they're, it's a different way of being than just being caught up in the projections of ignorance. Right. Uh, but are they also sort of undercutting ignorance or making it hard for ignorance to function or purifying ignorance away? Transforming ignorance. Transforming it. Yeah. Ignorance becomes wisdom. Ignorance itself becomes wisdom. Yeah. So, uh, so for example, when we look at the panic or hatred, at the beginning, we can look at the hatred, but, the, but the, then most of the time we have a question, where, right? Where should I look? Ah, sensation, there's sensation. Oh, there's an image. There's a lot of slangs. <laughs> I don't want to repeat those. <laughs> we all have, yeah? Bala, 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 yada, yada, yada. And there's a, there's a belief. So the hatred becomes four pieces. If you don't look at the pieces, you cannot see hatred. And these four pieces, what we call interdependent, that without sensation, how you can hate? Without the image, object, to whom you're going to hate? Without that articulation, hatred cannot come. Without the belief, the view, this is a right, this is a wrong, this is a should not, you cannot have hatred. So what we call interdependent. And they are changing, changing, changing. Sometimes when we hate, we think it will be forever, but it will change. When I feel panic, I think, will be forever, my life is doomed, but it will change. So when we look at the more, more, more into that, what we call emptiness. So we can reach the mind, which is beyond concept, yet not nothing. There's a clarity, luminosity, the present, sometimes what we call a wakeful present. And that is the how to connect with the also to 
the Buddha Nijayaka. Final question in, the, in this set of questions is, uh, what does awakening to the nature of mind, to Buddha nature, make possible for us uh, in terms of our lives, our relationships to others, our highest possibilities? What does awakening to our Buddha nature make possible? So the main thing is that whatever happened, we can find there's something which is the essence or, or the, the nature always present, beyond, free. There's some kind of like contentment there, the joy. Though on the service level, a million things are happening. Like even panic comes. But the nature of panic, awareness, luminosity, wisdom, love and compassion. So it looks like panic, but it's not panic. It's a wisdom. The nature of panic is not panicking. Yeah. It is, as I mentioned before, we don't need to get rid of ignorance, but ignorance transforms. Sometimes what we call mirror-like wisdom. Oh, no, not mirror. Uh, Non-conceptual wisdom. And hatred, anger transform, mirror-like wisdom. Pride transform, wisdom of equanimity. So all this transform. It's not that you have to fight with them, get rid of them. And actually, we don't need to get rid of anything. You are Buddha right now, right here. But we need to recognize. So sometime, I went to the Oregon. Oregon. Oregon, and there's a national park, and there's a tree, dead tree. I was very surprised. Wow, this tree, and I tried to touch. It is stone. Pet petrified. Petrified. petrified tree, right? So it's changed. It is stone, transformed already, but still remain, look like tree. Same shape, same color. So thought can come, emotion can come, but they transform. Um, thank you, Rinpoche. Uh, one other question I had is, as a Buddhist teacher here in the West, I mean, you're based, you live and you're based in Nepal and you support uh -huh. monasteries and study centers in Nepal and are developing them. But also here in the West, you've, you've become a major teacher in the West, many Westerners. So as a Buddhist teacher of spiritual practice in the West, um, how have you needed to adapt Buddhist teachers, uh, I'm sorry, Buddhist teachings in order to meet Western minds? Right. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, so that's, I think, very important. So when I was young, my father always said the teachings need to adapt with the mentality, personality, culture base. That's what Buddha said. So my teachings, the essence, no need to change. But how that practice, how that connect with the different level of mentality. And we talk, talk a lot about personalities also. And also culture, all this. So, excuse me, it's very important. Uh, and even the examples, stories, all these are need to adapt. First time I went I came to USA in 1998, and I was teaching in California, Bay Area. And I told them, oh, when we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, all the virtues flourish like summer river. And they said, what? <laughs> so summer river in Bay Area has become dry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but summer river in Nepal, India, monsoon time, flourish, you know. <laughs> Now, in addition to that, Rinpoche, uh, certainly there's been um, a way to adapt forms of communication, anecdotes, images, and things of that sort. But I would imagine that talking about the nature of mind in a Western context probably el elicits from in people in that context that you're, you're talking about something primarily conceptual, yeah. something thinking. And of course, it's clearly not what 
you're referring right. to, it includes thinking, but right. it's not simply an activity of the discursive yeah. mind. So that would be a big, um, maybe a, a, a very significant example of adaptation to try to cut through certain right. kinds of presuppositions about what even the word mind means sure. in a certain context. Yeah. Maybe you could say something a little bit more about that, but what are other more significant initial barriers that you have found and the activity of teaching and communicating right. that you have needed to um, adapt and, uh, and maybe have done so in a way that has um, maybe even significantly adjusted your own appreciation of the potential right. of your tradition. And, uh, yeah. of the Actually, I learned a lot from science also. Uh, 1999, I came to USN and I looked for that, that time that the tape, you know, very big. The, what do you call this? Video yeah. tape, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very big, just 60 minutes. <laughs> I have to take this big one. I buy from the shop and then when I go back to India, I have one bag is full of these videos from the scientists. Some they talk about psychology and a little bit about um, cognitive behavior. The therapy is some kind of like how to work with the mind. Cognitive behavioral therapy? Something like that. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, not much that time, mm -hmm. less. And then the physics and then the social kind of like studies, quite good. So I went, I bring this to India and I watch and I have, I don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a translator. And eventually I try to come to the rest again from the 2000, year 2000. Yeah. And I have a lot of engaged. I think I learn a lot, normally what I call, I teach, but at the same time I'm learning from the student. Mm -hmm. And like these, um, Special, some terms are very difficult to translate. The concept is very difficult to translate. And what we call namdo in Tibetan. And that, still I cannot find the right words. So concept is also namdo. Thought is also namdo. But then people think thought, just thinking. So meditation beyond thought mm -hmm. become <laughs> and you become a zombie, isn't it? And I think that's the what well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about meditation. Yeah. And another misunderstanding is um, people think meditation meaning think of nothing, empty mind, empty brain, you know, or uh, look for peace, calm, joy. Meditation associated with the peace, mm -hmm. full of peace, relax, and the peace, <laughs> embrace, a uh, uh, wakeful present right now. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, peace. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what we got, the, the more you look for peace and come joy, Normally they will say, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> and also the more you try to keep your mind quiet, worse. Mm -hmm. So normally what I call pizza meditation. Anybody knows about pizza meditation? <laughs> How many of you know pizza meditation? <laughs> oh, not many, good. <laughs> <laughs> so we will try pizza meditation for one minute. Please keep your, <laughs> keep your spine loosely straight. And the, for the pizza meditation has one rule, which is you are not allowed to think of pizza. <laughs> you can think of anything else except pizza, okay? <laughs> Be ready. One. When you hear three, no pizza, okay? Two. Three, no pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How was it? <laughs> Pizza came or no? 
<laughs> How many of you think of pizza raise your hand? <laughs> oh, so that's normal. So what we call aversion or try to resist something, it makes actually that louder and stronger. So for me, when I was young, panic, I had panic attacks. So one of the main problem is panic of panic, fear of panic. So the real, when we meditate, you yeah, allow the pizza can come. <laughs> but not lost, not forget. Like when we practice breathing meditation, remember the breath. As long as if you remember the glimpse of the breath, breath, then pizza comes, no problem. Two pizza, three pizza, ten pizza comes around. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you, do you find that um, students and audiences in more or less Western contexts find themselves struggling especially with a, an intent, not just an intention, but a certain kind of prior understanding of what it is that they're looking for? looking for peace or looking for happiness. So earlier when we, were, we began the session, you were talking about intention. Right. How is uh, the forming of intention not necessarily the setting up of expectations that might actually block right. the practice? And right. maybe that's something that you find in, in contexts like these more than other places or not. But if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think the... Just now I mentioned about expectation, peace, peace, peace. Mm -hmm. So what we call, then peace will say I'm busy. And then we, we cannot experience peace very easily actually. And in the end we of course, dis 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 uh, disappoint, another word. Uh, anyway. Frustrated or Frustrated, disappointed. Disappointed. So, there's another important that to keep in the mind what we were at the beginning. And of course, peace, calm, clarity, joy, these are what we call byproduct of meditation, mm -hmm. not the essence of meditation. Our essence of meditation is awareness. And then also let thought come in and go is what we call letting go of aversion. But stay with the breath, letting go of craving. So normally our mind wanders and follow monkey mind, and we lost. But with the breath, being with the breath as it is, what we call just seeing the nature of the breath, shallow breath, deep breath, irregular breath, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So that is what we call beginning of wisdom. Just witness, witness of the, the nature of re reality itself. We don't need to change it. We don't have to make nice breath. Beautiful reality, not necessary. If the, if the reality is messy, be with the messy. <laughs> but in the end, the true nature of reality, as I mentioned before, multiple cities, so many pieces, and they are interdependent, mm -hmm. and they are changing, 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 and the end cannot find. Mm -hmm. And that I learned a lot from the physics. Mm -hmm. Although in the meditative tradition, we talk about that, and I watch these videos, wow, they are talking something. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more um, about uh, feeling? So, you know, we, we, when I think people look to meditation as a way of solving a problem, it's often in terms of certain kinds of thought patterns or they think that they have to struggle with, with thoughts. But you've mentioned several times that uh, it's also very important to be in touch with, with feeling yeah. and perception. Right. I wonder if that's also a part of adaptation or speaking to something that may be not so well cultivated right. in Western contexts. Right. It's the feeling world. Right. Um, so could you say a little bit more about that and practice and feeling? So yeah, what we call, first we need to connect with the less awareness with the breath. Then second is the body. So when we connect with the body, that's the beginning of connecting with the feeling world. So just, just like we did a little bit, right? Just uh, feel the gravity or feel the sensation, feel the temperature, feel the tactile. Of course, when you feel the body, 
you need to feel through tactile, through sensation. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, the shape color doesn't work very well. Uh, we even don't know who, what we look like very clear, except unless we look at the mirror, right? <laughs> so the doorway, experiential connection, the doorway is the sensation and the tactile. Mm -hmm. And next is what we call feeling. So once there's tactile, once there's sens sensation, then feeling comes. So feeling pleasant, unpleasant, and there's a neutral feeling also. Mm -hmm. So to connect with the feeling, awareness feeling become one, there's one practice. Another one is the love and compassion, what we call love, compassion, joy, then equanimity, the subtle feeling. All these are connected with emotion and feeling, positive emotion feeling. So these are, I think, for the practice is, uh, yeah, it's very important. John, um, do you want to move into some uh, dialogue with, um, say, Christian context, or do you have some more questions that you would like to ask before we do that? No, I think we can, uh, yeah, you yeah. could ask a, yeah. a, there is a question about, did, did you want to pose it? Yeah, Brian? sure, I'd be no. happy to pose it. So um, actually at dinner uh, this evening, we were, we were talking about different places you have taught in the U.S. And you mentioned, I believe you said, that the first place that you taught uh, was at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. Was that the first one, place in the U.S.? One of the, yes. One of the, one of the first. In it. And uh, it was a lovely connection to make. That is a place where I studied uh, theology. And, and um, I was really drawn to that place because of the monastic yes. context. Yes. It's a, the, it's, a, it's a Christian it monastic. A Christian uh, monastic Benedictine. University. Benedictine, or, university with yeah. a seminary and yeah. undergraduates and so forth. So similar to Boston College in certain respects, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but very different in other respects because it had the monastic culture. And uh, so you were saying um, a bit about what that experience was like for you. You could talk about that, but I... But, the, but that is really a, a prompt for this question. You've had some experience in teaching in many different places, but also those that are affiliated with Christianity or the Christian monastic uh, context. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what that has been like for you. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe what it has been like to have those in those contexts to receive something the kinds of questions right. that they would ask or the insights that they might have or things that struck you as memorable or worthy for um, you know, your own kind of adjustment or right. learning. Yeah, so I think in the past, I think from 2004 or five, I went to Europe, I met uh, some Benedict things in Germany, I went to monastery also. Mm -hmm. Benedictine monastery, and we had a meal here together. And then, yeah, St. John. So in St. John, I met uh, some few Benedictines, and then we went to the special dorm that uh, outside are not allowed, only the monastery members. Yes. I have access, privilege to <laughs> access. And uh, I went to the, in the dorm and the, the room. There's a how they live. Uh, very simple, but very kind of like meditative in environment. Mm -hmm. It was a very nice memory for me. <clears throat> and I have, we have some discussions with the Benedictines there. And the main thing I always uh, really admire in Christian tradition is the emphasis of love and compassion. Mm -hmm. and and then some in Germany, one of the Benedictines said they practice the main focus on the love and compassion, and the love is also God. Although you cannot touch, you cannot love, you cannot um, conceptually, you cannot touch, but love is there, mm -hmm. and same as the God. So I felt, wow, this is really so for us when we practice meditation on love and compassion, through love we can go beyond concept, yet, yet at the same time, there's a feeling of love. Yeah. And uh, 
And then another thing what I learned is a lot of the social engagement aspect mm. that really uh, connect with the many people and doing a lot of social work. That's a really wonderful thing uh, we need to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, maybe I could uh, invite you to say a little bit more about the relationship between conceptual and right. non-conceptual. Right. We've already been talking about that to some extent. Practice. Practice. Um, and uh, I might just preface my question by saying that um, it's also the case in the, in the Christian tradition um, that there is a relationship between conceptual practices by which is meant use of image, uh, devotion, uh, object, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, chanting, breath, mm -hmm. icon. Mm -hmm. Uh, imagining your ima imagining your present with Jesus exactly. mm -hmm. as he's experiencing what he's going through yes. and you're there with him. Ritual, liturgy, worship, and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But there's also, uh, maybe not as well known as it ought to be, but definitely a long tradition within the broader Christian tradition of non-conceptual mm -hmm. awareness, mm -hmm. where maybe uh, in prayer and meditation, uh, one begins with um, image, devotion, mm -hmm. uh, ritual, but at some point drops any focus at all, mm -hmm. um, just simply in the presence of God, mm -hmm. without any particular image of God, mm -hmm. without any agenda mm -hmm. to trying to get something from God, without any preoccupation with oneself mm -hmm. or others around and just simply let, let be certain technical names for that kind of prayer, but it is certainly present. Um, so letting God draw you, letting God draw you into more intimacy with God. Yes. Like that. Yes. And that's more know. non conceptual. You're not doing the work. Yes. Right. So sometimes it's called passive prayer or mm. contemplation. Mm. Sometimes in the Christian tradition, there's a distinction between mental prayer or meditation oh. and contemplation. Mm. Contemplation often reserved for right, right. non-conceptual. Mm -mm. But uh, with all of that said, mm -mm. say a little bit more about why, I mean, at some point uh, earlier in a conversation, we, you, you were mentioning the difficulty that we can have with concepts, mm -mm. you know, broadly speaking. But yet we, we want to enlist concepts, right. not simply destroy or somehow be free from concepts or some right. coexistence of the two. Right. So how might I learn uh, uh, from you in terms of your own understanding of the relationship between conceptual and non-conceptual right. practice? Yeah. So for us, at the beginning, we have to engage with the concept. But the concept is supported by non-conceptual, <laughs> in a way. So what we call view and the meditation and application, we have to have three. View need to begin with the conceptual at the beginning, mm -hmm. from the intellectual level. And then that intellectual, we need to connect with the sense of being, the meditation. So meditation is just being with what we call, we don't need to do anything. Sometimes what we call non-meditation is the best meditation. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you are not doing, being with the reality as it is, but at the same time, not lost. The sense of presence, sense of being, and completely natural, three qualities. Not doing anything is more like being, mm -hmm. but not lost, completely natural, three qualities. So, so then eventually, three aspects, as I mentioned, awareness, love and compassion, wisdom. So these three aspects at the beginning, this conceptual level, then bring into the experiential level with the being with that, innate quality, what we call, is there within us. We need to discover it. Then there's so many different techniques how you discover. At the beginning, I don't believe that my father said, you have wonderful nature. Actually, your innate quality and quality of the Buddha and the dog also the same. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me, me and dog, oh, <laughs> same. 
how come my nature and the Buddha, oh, I am suffering, suffering. I have huge suffering, the panic. And my mind is a monkey mind. That's impossible. But then there's a step by step by step by technique how to discover that. So, and one of the things that we can use with the concept, what we call uh, visualization, imagination. Imagination of Buddha, first with the concept, then let go in the end, what we call dissolution. And then there's a, the, like icon, sometimes we focus on the, the Buddha has sometimes some holding flower, represents of compassion. Some holding the lamb or wheel, which is wisdom. And we focus on that icon sometimes. And sometimes what we call the mental recitation. That's the, that's the, I think first my meditation technique is the, the reciting mantra in the mind. Hmm. Om Mani Peme Hum. Mani, not the money. <laughs> <laughs> Although that would be okay too. <laughs> so I, in my hometown, everybody meditating. I mean, my family. My mother don't meditate much. But my grandpa, grandma, my father, they meditate. When they meditate, they're really peaceful and calm. So I thought I'm going to meditate. I'm imitating. And went to the cave. I pretend that I'm meditating. And after five minutes later, <laughs> <laughs> then one day I thought, what should I do? You know, oh. In my hometown, everybody recite the, the, the mantra, Om Mani Pemi Hum. I thought, oh, I should recite that. In the mind, so I close my mouth and recite the Om Mani Bemo in my mind. I feel like I did something. Mm -hmm. Don't know uh, what I'm doing. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> so then, when I was nine years old, I first time I asked to my father to teach me meditation. And first question is, reciting mantra in the mind is a meditation or not? He said, Yes, that's a meditation. So I think these are, we have very similar as yeah. what you mentioned. Yeah. So um, at some point, uh, it, it would be nice uh, if Rinpoche Jay wished to lead another meditation that's in the direction of more of just being Still. or openness. Yeah. Or okay. A, that's a different style of meditation yeah. then. Hmm? Let's do that. So, one of the meditation technique is, uh, so as I mentioned before, that our mind is like lamp, right? It has the quality of lumi. Lu luminosity is not like light, or not like vivid, clear, not like that. The mind itself is luminosity. So, even we feel dullness, we can experience dullness. That is luminosity. That's the clarity. So can you see my hand? So that is the luminosity also. The image of hand appear in our mind, has to come through the mind. And so not just image, sound, smell, taste, sensation. Everything is in the consciousness, in the mind happening in the mind. So all these are what we call the reflection on the lake. Did I tell the story about the lake? Not here? No, not yet. Oh, yeah, I forget. Um, uh, I went to a Creston in Colorado, and I hiked a mountain. On the halfway, there's a, a lake, very beautiful. And in the lake, entire valley, Reflection appear in the lake, the trees, rocks, there's a deer also, <clears throat> the sky, <clears throat> and the water is so clean. I can drink the water, they said. I drink a little bit. I'm so happy. And then I walk again. And after one hour later, and the weather changed. Now the, in the sky, full of cloud in the sky and almost rain. So my friend said we should go back. So we come down, look at the lake. Now the lake become muddy become like a chai, you know, India tea, <laughs> Indian tea, or Tibetan tea. <laughs> and I thought, what happened? 
within one minute, the lake become muddy, it's impossible. So I went to the close, look at the lake, doesn't change, legs doesn't change. But because of the cloud, now that reflection of the cloud appear in the lake, so look like lake become muddy, but actually lake is not muddy. So therefore, the, the surface of the lake has ability to reflect. And that is like clarity of mind, the awareness, the fundamental quality of mind. And we have thought, emotion, perception, memory, all the are like reflection in the lake. No matter ugly reflection, not ugly, bright, dark, it doesn't matter. It's all our reflection. So whatever we experiencing in the mind is form of the mind, the, the clarity. So how to connect with that? Like lamp. So first, let's say in this empty space, there's a light, full of light, right, in this empty space. Can we see light in the empty space easily or not? Not so easy to see light in the empty space, right? But you can see light on my face, on my hand, on the floor, on the wall, on the ceiling, quite easy. But seeing with the empty space is quite difficult. So therefore, first we connect with awareness through breath. Being with the breath, knowing breath is awareness. Listen to sound. Being with the sound, knowing sound is also awareness. Then in the end, be with the awareness itself. So this is a very advanced meditation practice. So I don't know, all of you are, <laughs> all of you want to try that or not? Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, if you want to try, raise your hand. Oh, very advanced. I, I saw every hand raised. I saw every hand. <laughs> okay, come home. <laughs> So, fasten seat belt. Fasten seat belt. Fastening the belt. Yeah. Fasten seat belt, right? Yes. Yeah. Fasten your seat belts. Fasten your seat belts, yeah. Because it's beyond non conceptualist, you know. So, <laughs> so now the actual. <laughs> actual. <laughs> We, we have big secret in the end, so now I'm thinking about that, I'm, I'm feeling laugh, you know. <laughs> okay, anyway. <clears throat> so, there's two steps. The first is what we call, just relax. And you don't need to meditate. Just uh, rest our mind, like after having physical exercise. Maybe you jog into the mountain or in the, le in, the, in the garden, half hours, and feel a little bit tired, right? And sit on nice bench. <sighs> Just like that. And no need to meditate. And if you're not meditating, then whatever your mind doing is fine. Bala, bala, bala is fine. Yada, yada, yada is fine. Pizza is okay, whatever. <laughs> Messi is also okay. B, Messi, A. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's our instruction. Okay. And, and we have another example about the, uh, after deep, deep breathing, after big sigh. What do you call it? Sigh. <sighs> we rest like, right? Or after taking a shower, after cook. And and what do you, how you rest in your life? Maybe you can, you can mention some examples. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> in the, pardon? Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> 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 how, how about after exam? In the school, in the university? <laughs> <laughs> or after finish the deadline? What else? Coffee. Coffee also? Play with the dog. Play with the dog. Breathe. Breathe, yeah. All these are good examples. So you, you get the sense, right? You, you have to have some kind of sense how just be. And don't worry, you're not meditating. So 
Don't worry about am I doing right or wrong or how can I tell this is the right practice? No need to worry because you are not meditating. Okay, and we will do with this uh, with the one deep breathing exercise. So first, no, now, no, now. I will do first. Okay, first you breathe in slowly. And when you're breathing out, just follow the natural, what we call, rhythm. Not, in, <laughs> not like that. And when we breathe in, not like that. <laughs> so, if you do that, then we will see galaxies and <laughs> stars. And without using tele, tele, telegram, they all come. So we have to breathe slowly. Like, like follow the natural gravity, you know, let go. And then we rest, space in between the breaths. So let go. Few seconds, maybe five, four, five seconds. And breathe in. And after that, natural breath and continue rest. And then we will do again another deep breathing, so three times. You understand? So when you rest in between, the space in between the breath, you're almost, the throat are open. Probably lungs also open. Almost you breathe in, but not really breathe in. Like that. Now please um, keep your spine loose and straight. And you can use the chair as support for your back also. And for me, it's quite difficult. My legs are quite short, but, uh, but supposed to touch both legs to the ground. And you can put your hand on your knees like that. <clears throat> and first, Close your eyes and feel the body. And just relax muscles in the body and mind, body, both just relax. Okay, now if you want, you can open your eyes also. So slowly breathe in. Slowly, slowly, deep breathe in. And let go. And rest. Rest breath, rest mind. Now breathe in and natural breath and continue rest. And this is the only first step, so you don't need to meditate. Don't worry about doing right or wrong. Now, deep breathing in again. <sighs> now, natural breath and continue rest.
Now last deep breathing, slowly so breathe in. Now natural breath, you don't need to do any deep breathing, just, just natural breath and rest. Now please open your eyes if you're closed and then rest your mind as it is with open eyes. Okay. How was it? How many of you feel a little bit relaxed? Raise your hand. Okay. Now the real practice comes, you know. <laughs> the the non-conceptual practice. That's what we need to fasten your sitta. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody ready? <coughs> yes, raise your hand. <laughs> many of you are laughing, so I, I think you know the big secret already. How many of you know the secret? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. So, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Two parts, right? The first is just be, right? Rest. You don't have to meditate. And we did that together. So that is just a preparation. So the second is the non-conceptual being awareness with itself. Sometimes what we call sometimes non-conceptual meditation, open awareness meditation, objectless meditation. We have many names for that. So that one, that that one. Now I'm going to teach you. But. Before that, I want to tell you a big secret. So I don't know, should I tell you or not? <laughs> I'm kind of ner nervous, it's a big secret, and uh, we have online, and, <laughs> and if you promise, then I will share you. Not tell anybody, I will share. <laughs> it's in my books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> The big secret is, actually, the open awareness meditation is already done. Finish. There's no second step. <laughs> so what we did together, that is the practice of being awareness with itself. And what we call, we don't need to meditate. Non-meditation is the best meditation. But at the same time, we are not lost. When we let our mind be as it is, the sense of presence, sense of being, and the nature quality of the mind is clear, clear and knowing. Always there. You all are not unconscious now, right? <laughs> yes or no? So how many of you are unconscious? Raise your hand. <laughs> so, if, if you, even you said, I'm unconscious, <laughs> that means you are not unconscious. <laughs> so, experience of unconscious is not, <laughs> not unconscious. So, the, the quality of mind is clear and knowing, and that is always there. 
So then we don't have to do anything. Just be. <laughs> so that is the one of the most important step of practice of the going to nature of mind practice. So normally we don't share natural mind practice in the public. Why? What we call we have to practice step by step experiential lineage so we have to experience that but then if you intellectually to to grab the idea of natural mind the practice itself the one is become intellectual later not easy to bring into experience so therefore i don't teach in the public and i have this a uh, path like um, the course, what we call joy of living, path of liberation, step by step practice. Then we introduce the nature mind practice. It's like if you want to watch a movie and you know the ending part, beginning of the movie, then what happened? Gone, right? So, but this practice right now is the very important foundation of to, to approach the practice of natural mind. Of course, we already discussed about the quality of natural mind already. Uh, thank you, Rinpoche. Um, just one thought that this raised for me. Uh, it seems like a, another very important part of the tradition that you're uh, teaching from uh, is that the kinds of things that you're teaching are not just techniques. If nobody had ever learned how to embody them, none of us could learn it by just trying to adopt a technique and then struggling to try to learn this self-help technique better. Right. It seems to me that the first, the real, the real first step of all this is when we need to meet somebody who embodies it. And then when they speak from that quality, that, that way, that quality of being and share a way of accessing and they can share it because they embody it, then we have a chance to catch on. And that particular point is not prominent in the adaptation of meditation practices into modern Western cultures, mm -hmm. by and large. Right. There's a tendency to reduce the whole process to a self-help technique right. that ignores the fact that we need to, what in modern psychology is sometimes said, we need to scaffold upon someone who embodies. Right. Uh, and if nobody's embodying it, how could we possibly learn to embody it? We need to lean on, we need to scaffold on, just like a child needs to scaffold upon their mother right. to learn how to become a human being. We need that in order to learn how to become, how to, how to become these ways of being. Right. And that's just fundamental. I think that's equally true in Christian tradition as it yes, is it in is. Buddhist traditions yeah. and almost, not totally, but almost totally ignored in the adaptation meditation of the West with all the great things happening, mm -hmm. and the neuropsychologists that, that studied your brain, <laughs> Rinpoche, uh, at, which are all wonderful and important uh, uh, progress mm -hmm. in learning more about what's possible for human beings. That particular point, uh, I think, is really critical. And also, the, the reason it comes up for me here is just because it's so obvious here. Mm -hmm that that's what's going on. Somebody's, I mean, obviously, that's why we're all here, right? Because <laughs> reputedly, someone's learned how to be a certain way of being and can speak from that place. And then we can begin to catch on to that kind of, it's not just what's said, and then me struggling to take it up and make it, make me into it. It's more like resonating with someone. And this is, this, in Buddhism, this right. is refuge in. 
Buddha and Dharma as it becomes embodied in Sangha who embodies it, the spiritual community. It just seems like that's such a foundational and critical point to just raise up. Yes, and you and I have discussed this on any number of occasions, um, you know, in terms of what Buddhism and Christianity share on this point, on many other points. And in the Christian tradition, um, there is no individual Christian. There is no individual person who constitutes what Christian faith is, but Christian faith Christian practice is relational, inherently communal. Of course, it has an element of discipleship um, to Christ, but that discipleship is embodied among others, the saints, those who have gone before, those who are gathered in community. And so it is a, it's a real distortion of the kind of wisdom compassion and so forth that's, that we're talking about here, which would be cultivated in the Christian tradition to imagine that it is done by an individual. It is something that is received. Um, in the Christian tradition, very often you'll hear uh, about the imitation of Christ, imitatio Christi. A, a rather superficial notion of that is Jesus engages in certain kinds of behaviors, and then I am going to imitate those behaviors the best that I can. Sort of like there's an external model, and then now I'm going to imitate that as best as I can, that's how according we modern, to my wits. That's how we modern people yes, think of that, right. yeah. But that's a very thin uh, understanding of what imitatio really means. It's really about receiving the presence of another, of receiving oneself from another, and of course transmitting what one has received to others in a, in a circularity. That's how, in the most profound sense, Christians understand God as relational love, not just as an external elevated object out there, but a dynamic living reality of receiving and of transmitting. And, um, so anyway, I, to, to the point uh, that you're making. Um, and so if, in, let's say, in the Christian tradition, there were to be any effort to renew the contemplative dimensions of that tradition in dialogue with Buddhism or any other tradition, if that communal or that relational matrix right. is not fundamental to it, then there's going to be something deeply stunted right. limiting about that. Right. But I do think that this is an example of what we've shared here together, the communication of that, which gives us permission, you might say, or the mind that's grasping permission to relax into what is actually present, but as embodied by another. There's something, yeah. there's something prior to speaking that's, that, that can happen, I would say, is happening and then also speaking is happening but there's something prior to the speaking that is also communicating from the quality of being of someone who learns to increasingly yeah. embody that quality of being and then we may we may be attracted to that because there's something in us that recognizes that right. in in that person or in that spiritual community that's already in communication yeah. even before we can comprehend what what is communicating to what yeah. and that also seems to have to do with buddha nature yeah. and part of what's really important in tibetan buddhism and other deep contemplative traditions um, there was one other question i had and then Brian, I'm not sure if you have more, but then we also wanted to have we do. people chat. Feel free, go ahead. Yeah. The one is uh, when someone or more and more people begin to realize the qualities of the nature of mind or Buddha nature in the various ways that that becomes possible, how does that empower us uh, better to respond? to the great 
problems of our world, like the problem of the, the devastation of our natural world, uh, the um, increasing violence in the world, um, the inequities in the world, the greed. Uh, how does realizing qualities of nature of mind help us or empower us to better respond to those things? Yeah, I always think about when I'm having communication with others, there's a, what we call view that respect that everybody has basic innate goodness. And then this basic innate goodness are radiating actually with the communication, with the behavior, although the person is uh, having a lot of problems, but still there's a, this great call, call it as a manifesting. But the important is we need to mature or recognize that. We need to walk with that. We need to hold on that. So maybe I will tell you a story. One time a couple came to me and they're having big problem. The, the husband is one to control everything. And the wife has the tendency always worry. Everything she worry. So and then they both come to me and ask me, could you please bless us? And they're expecting some power that I can, <laughs> you know, particular blessing and yes, and tomorrow no problem, no argument. <laughs> so I told them I don't have that power, power, you know, that kind of blessing I don't have. And they're kind of disappointed. <laughs> and I told them, but I can give you uh, advice. Although I don't have that particular power, but maybe we can give you advice. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, anything from you, we will try our best. <laughs> and I told them, okay, from today on, you have to make in one day half hour time for positive discussion. And try to discuss about the good things, good qualities about each other. They say, okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> and they're gone. And I haven't met them for a few weeks, and a few weeks later they come back and they say, ah, half hour is too long. You know? <laughs> 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 we begin to have this discussion. Oh yeah, first time when I was, you know, when I met you and you have kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> but not now, you know, almost you know. And then they they look at each other, <laughs> look at the watch, <laughs> and then they ask me, what should I do? And I told them, okay, okay, no problem, I will give you a discount, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you cannot do a half hour, now only five minutes for a day. Oh. They said, oh, that's okay, <laughs> we can do five minutes. And they gone, I, I, I haven't met them for one year. And after one year later, they came, they said, thank you for your advice. Now." 30 minutes is not enough. Huh. And I was surprised, wow. I, I was not expecting that change, you know. I asked, oh, what happened? They said when they begin to discuss only five minutes, and actually they discover a lot of good things within each other. Actually they care each other, they love each other, and there's some more good qualities that they discuss, and they are talking about that. So then when we discuss what have happened, the recognition comes. So ignorant, not recognize. Recognize is awareness, wisdom. So like we go to therapist and we talk about our problem for 12 times, feel better, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, what I heard of that good therapy, learn how to listen. So, so now, they cannot really change their personality. The problem is husband still want to control <laughs> and wife still worry. But now they talk about each other and they put sense of humor about their personality. And what they do is the, when the husband comes in, knock the door and making humor about his personality. The most powerful person in the world is coming. <laughs> <laughs> And the wife opened the door, or oh, the most worried person in the world welcomes you. <laughs> <laughs> and they give each other a name. So the husband's name is Control Freak. <laughs> and the wife's name is Worry Freak. <laughs> <laughs> and they 
really get along. And a lot of, although you cannot change this uh, directly, but they are working every day. Mm. Trust mm. me. So I think this is really important to see this, this innate qualities within each other. When we talk about that, then I think the world will become better, better place, I think. Really just see each other more accurately. Yep. See more in each other. Yes, yes, yes. So what I heard of that, if you have 10 qualities with us, one negative, nine positive. Normally what we see is only one negative. And we exaggerate that one negative and deny the nine quality. Good thing, excuse me, with us. Brian, um, shall we Yes, ask? we have about 15 minutes yeah. for conversations from those who are in the audience. So this is a time when you have the opportunity and this is a pretty rare opportunity here at Boston College to uh, ask any questions you may have or anything you'd like to raise with Rinpoche and uh, related to all the things that we've discussed and so forth. So, so I'm gonna ask you to ask your question with the use of the microphone so that way those who are um, joining us by Zoom can hear. So if you want to point to people and I'll just oh, sure. be the Thanks, one Brian. who gives the microphone. But please feel free. So, oh, there's one right there and then one there. Oh, thank you, Rinpoche. Um, if we are already Buddha and um, uh, we're just not recognizing and we have some deformant, can we just use single practice uh, purification to purify the deformant and then we'll be Buddha? So we don't need any other uh, practice, just one purification like Madhusasva. Is that sufficient? Uh, we need a few things. Awareness, love and compassion, wisdom. In the end, it will become one. But what do we call to grow this flower? The soil, water, seed, uh, oxygen, and sunlight. Some cause and condition comes together, then grow the flower in the future. So at least what we call shamatha, which is connected with awareness, loving kindness, compassion, which is connected with the 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 metta and the wisdom and that also form it as um, session practice or informal practice so view meditation application has to come together so just reciting mantra 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 only it doesn't it helps but uh, if re recite the mantra with awareness love and compassion wisdom together then really become if you practice purification, then it will become complete practice. Brian, there's, there is one there, then we'll come back. Thank you, thank you for being here in Pache. So my question, it's a little like Mama John's question, but thinking about, there's so many people who are very angry and hate this other group of people, and the other group of people hates them back. And so if we're in one of those two groups, which many of us are, how do, we, how do we work with sort of looking at people who we see as hateful doing bad things and, and get that compassion for them? Because it's, it's really hard when you see, you feel like what they're doing is so uncompassionate and so hurtful to other people. Yeah, so one, one time, me and my father, we are having dinner together. And there's a group of people came, uh, came to learn meditation from my father. There's, there's two men within the group and they don't like each other. And they fight. Sometimes they beat each other. And that evening, they are fighting outside. And people cannot stop. Hitting each other with stick. And then me and my father, we, are, we, we don't know how to do. There's no, if you call police, sometimes Nepal doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, so then having this Tibetan uh, soup called tupa. And suddenly one man came. <sighs> He's the one hit the stick to other men, you know. <sighs> Rinpoche, please help me how to control my anger. Teach me, you know. And my father said, oh, yeah, why are you angry at him? 
he said, no, 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 he's really bad. And he said, bad things about me. And he harmed me and he beat me. Oh, because of the words, because of he beat you, then maybe you should angry at the stick and the words from that person. He said, I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of logic doesn't work with me. St stupid logic. And my father said, why? You know, Because the stick is controlled by him. The word is just, doesn't mean anything, but controlled by him. So I hate him, not the stick. And my father said, oh, OK, OK, that means who control that you hate the controller that means the the real control of that person is the hatred the anger the ignorance the aversion and that person also doesn't have control just like you you don't have control you come here to ask me there's help but the, when the anger hatred comes you cannot control isn't it he said oh yeah <laughs> Whew, that's true you know he changes face and and he's keep thinking, you know. And I think this is there's a lot of people are fighting and the, hate each other, even people in you know, the hate personally to you or society. I think the most important is what we call, of course, we have this uh, uncomfortable feeling. We might angry, we might feel hate. We can think, we can hate about the haters, what we call. We can hate about the, their behave. But they themselves, in a way, deeper level, they have this basic innate goodness. But they have become out of control. So, so when we connect like that way, then there's a really connection. But at the same time, we are not ignoring that nothing happens, no life is happening. So, that the teaching from my father really helps. I think that my my help nowadays. Mm. There is one over there, and then back there as well. Thank you so much. Um, as a therapist, <laughs> I often encounter um, great suffering in individuals. Um, and there are Western concepts that I've learned of what mental illness can be and um, certain ways, I guess, using the analogy of the candle and the flame, um, certain ways in which uh, traumas or the body makeup itself mm -hmm. can hinder um, someone from even having a wick or the wick is wet. So no matter how close you put a flame, it will not right. ignite the second one. And I am wonder, it, it brings to me this question of that nature of mind um, and the hypothesis being that all of us have it and, you know, also the dogs and the chipmunks and all, all these things. But I, I'm struggling with that idea of mental illness that the West has and how to work with these practices um, in relation to that if, if in fact the candles do, are different in some way, if we're using that analogy. Or, and um, I'm wondering if there is this concept of mental illness in the Tibetan tradition, because um, I also find it difficult in a lot of things to see that you know the greatest illness is 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 merely ignorance or simply ignorance, um, and that is becoming very nuanced in today's um, in today's culture. So I'm wondering if you have any words for that. Yeah. So. What we call this ignorance has three layers, not just intellectual level ignorance. It's in the feeling level. So feeling level is connected with the subtle body. So the traumas are in the feeling level. It's connected with the prana, bindu, nadi. And then it comes in the perception level, even deeper. 
unconscious level, the ignorance. So, um, so what we call ignorant is not the same as I think in the West call ignorant. That might be the, again, might, it might have the different language here. But even though the words ignorant is there, but the deeper level, what we still believe that everybody has the basic innate goodness, the Buddha nature is there. But whether you recognize or not, not everybody can recognize. Like dogs, maybe sometimes. Who knows? Some dogs can, but almost impossible. Some dogs. No matter how you tell, oh, you have Buddha nature, Buddha nature every day. <laughs> nature mind, nature mind, nature mind. So sometimes what we call it doesn't work. And then we have to accept what Buddha said. You have to learn to accept. But at the same time, it doesn't mean, oh, they, are, they don't have anything, they're nothing, not like that. They have also great qualities. Everybody is unique. Everybody has different things, so respect that. And yeah, I have sometimes a lot of discussion with the psychologists and the therapists that when the trauma comes sometime at the beginning to learn meditation is very difficult. So I recommend to go to therapists and take some even needed medication all these are really important. Once the prana bindunati, which is in the body, when there's more calm, then you can learn meditation and then, and special, what we call yoga, but yoga meaning movement of physical. So special kind of like aerobic exercise, those are really helps. So meditation, therapy, medication, physical exercise, all these combined together, I think, helps. And then there was uh, one. There was one more right there. Thank you, Rinpoche. So let's say that we already have a formal meditation practice. Let's say that we have attended to one thousand courses, mm. and we are ready to take the next step, mm. meaning have a teacher. Mm. How do you find that teacher? Mm. And once you find that teacher, I mean, how do you start that relationship? Do you take refuge in bodhicitta? What do you do? Mm. The first, if you cannot find teacher, flip a coin and see. <laughs> 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 so what we call the first teacher is the person. Second teacher is the teaching of the teacher. That's very important. And what we call don't attach to the teacher. The teaching is important. Third teacher is the phenomena. Now you come into everyday life up and down, you, you can learn from that. So for me, the panic, I learn a lot from panic. The end, the end, the ultimate teacher is your true nature. So having saying that, as uh, John mentioned before, there's some kind of like transmission, what we call lineage transmission. So it has to be there. So. I create a curriculum, which is what we call Joy of Living 1, 2, 3. Then there's a path of liberation, which is a nature mind practice, level 5. So that some you can do online. You don't have to be in person. But the, there's one transmission. You have to be together with the teacher in person. Then rest you can do online. So. These things are important, and you don't need to find a one teacher. So what we call teachers like flower and student like bee, and uh, <laughs> teaching, teaching is a nectar, and we can take and to, to practice. And um, uh, and then the lineage transmission comes in body when we follow that lineage. And uh, like scientists said, uh, what we learn, 93% of a nonverbal, right? Mm -hmm. And from the word, only 7% what we learn is from the word. So that is the uh, contagious. The same thing, we, we go to Japan from America, People go to Japan, one week, actually we learn a lot. Come back, we transform, we change. But we didn't go to the formal university and learn from the professor, not like that. And Japanese person come to USA, one week, 
change. So this uh, comes like uh, non-verbal transmission. Time. So I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, it just occurs to me, maybe Justin, is there a simple uh, website address if if someone just wants to find out what Mingi Ripche is doing and what? Sure, it'd be uh, www.turgar.org, and Turgar is T-E-R-G-A-R. T-E-R-G-A-R, -E so www.turgar.org. Org. So I uh, just want to thank you so much, Ripche, for coming. Thank you. To us, yeah. And thank you all for being here. And um, um, your presence, I think, means a lot to each other and to us um, as well. This is a very memorable event. Um, and I just want to extend uh, my deep appreciation thank to you. you and to those traveling with you. Thank you for coming to BC. Thank, and yeah. thank you for spending time walking around with BC. We have this lovely image of, of us sitting uh, at, in the courtyard in front of the Babst Library under the trees. On the ground. On the ground. Yeah. And, uh, and um, I will always remember that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also mm. for both the professors. I uh, really appreciate to be here and to come to the uh, college here. Mm. Very appreciate and I have this opportunity. Very appreciate. Thank you so much. So I feel like Boston College is kind of a blessed place. <laughs> and it just, it just got more blessed. <laughs> uh, blessed from the monkey mind. <laughs>